Welcome to the I'm Book Podcast. I'm April O'Leary, and this is the YouTube version of our podcast. To get the audio version, you can hop on over to Spotify or anywhere that you consume audio podcasts. We are going to jump into some really cool content, so stay tuned for our next guest. We look forward to connecting with you, and be sure to subscribe. And to start your author adventure, hop on over to O'LearyPublishing.com, where you can map out the entire process and see what writing a book would look like for you. Let's get started. Hi, I'm April O'Leary. Welcome to the I'm Book Podcast. I'm super excited you've joined us for another episode. And today we're getting into talking about book distribution, which I know many of you are curious about. And so I had the opportunity to be introduced to John Bodie, who I have on the line here with me today. And he is, I'm going to read to you some of his credentials, which are quite impressive. He's the former CFO of SourceLink, Source Interlink Companies which at the time was the largest magazine distribution company in the US, as well as the leading publisher of enthusiast magazines, including Motor Trend, Hot Rod and Surfer. He's the former CFO of Tribune Publishing, the parent company of Los Angeles Times, oh, Orlando Sentinel. Uh, he's the current COO of ReaderLink Distribution Services, which is the largest book distributor in North America. And he's a member of the board of directors of Post Media, the largest newspaper group in Canada. And he has a wife and two sons. And coincidentally, he resides here in Naples, Florida, where I reside. So we haven't actually met in person yet. At some point, maybe our paths will cross. But welcome, John. So glad you're here. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity. So I would love to talk, you know, as a hybrid publisher, you know, we are operating a little bit in different worlds right now because you're working with the big five publishers and distributing the books they publish. And I want to get a feel for how that works in your world, working with some of the larger distributors and what your role is in helping distribute books. If we could start there. Sure. So, we're, you know, we're the nexus between the retail community that sells books, uh, the mass market retail community, so not bookstores, um, and, and the publishing community. And so, our goal and our role is kind of to be both the operational, meaning the logistics and the distribution centers and the freight between those two, those two groups, but also the, the brain. So helping publishers and retailers decide what books to sell where and, and how to merchandise those books appropriately to maximize sales and, uh, you know, try to do it in the most efficient way possible. So there, you know, there is a return component of this. It's not a perfect distribution system where, you know, every book we we distribute sells. We wish that was the case, but we do have returns, and so it's really important for us to use, you know, the data we have, the information we have, the historical sales we have, um, and that insight to try to put the right books in the right place at the right time. And that's a great obviously strategy because no one wants to have returns of any sort in any business. <laughs> so we want happy customers and happy, you know, businesses that work with us. So uh, in your world, when you are working with a larger publishing company and they bring a title to you, um, some of the places that you're getting those books into are where? So we're working with all the mass market retail, uh, retailers that sell books. So the big um, Walmarts and Targets of the world, the clubs, um, Sam's, Costco, BJ's, drug stores, um, grocery stores, so here in Florida, Publix, um, the airport stores, which aren't selling a lot of books at the moment, but are usually a big account for us. Um, but pretty much uh, anywhere that sells books in America on a shelf that's not a bookstore, they're purchasing their books from us. Okay. So you act, so you have both sides of the equation here, if I'm thinking as a, you know, you, as you described, so you've got those big box retailers that are coming to you with the um, shelf space, if you will, and then you're going between the publisher. So the publisher's not working directly with a Target or a Costco, they're working with ReaderLink. So because the large publishers care so much about this channel, they do value that direct communication with the retail community. So there is a lot of communication and coordination. Um, the buyers at those retail accounts want to hear directly from the publishers as to what new books are coming and, and get excited about those books. So there is a lot of 
um, communication, coordination, marketing discussions, and those kind of things. But the physical movement of the books, you know, and the financial transactions are from the publishers to us and then us to the retailer. Um, so th there isn't, a, there probably are examples out there where the retailers are, are, you know, buying directly from the publishers, but that wouldn't be through us. That'd be around us. Right. Okay. And so your, um, when you say the buyers from the retail side of it, so if I could understand better, the, let's say, let's take a Costco or a Target, they have their sort of book buyers who are looking for books that are going to sell in their box store, correct? And then you're yeah, sort of suggesting the titles that work would could potentially work for them? So we're, we're, we're making suggestions, recommendations, ultimately the decision of the retailers to what titles they want to buy and at what quantities. Um, and, and that's typical, really, how any um, consumer product would, would be sold into, you know, mass market retail. And so um, absolutely the retailer has the final decision. We're just using our information and our data to make recommendations and suggestions especially around, you know, should 12 copies of this book or eight copies of this book or 16 copies of this book be sent to, you know, a store, um, you know, in, in one of the stores in one of the, the markets. And, and so, um, you know, there's, I guess I'd say there's kind of what is the, the goal and the strategy that's set by the retailer. And then we are there to help them execute that strategy on a daily basis. Um, you know, working with literally thousands of titles and, you know, I know that you'd say the big publishers and they're an important part of our business, but we're literally working with hundreds of publishers um, along the way. So, um, you know, there's a, there is a lot, when you think about, you know, almost a hundred thousand storefronts in America and you think about the number of shelves in those stores and the number of positions on those shelves, um, there's a lot of variables in, in, um, you know, all that data has to be assimilated in such a way to make it a, you know, to make distribution effective. Sounds very, very complex. <laughs> it, and, it, you know, and knowing one time, you have to know one, the market. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it once at one time, right. It was done by a super local person um, dealing with a super local retailer, but as retail has consolidated, um, you know, distribution has consolidated. And so um, it's, it's uh, you know, it requires a, a significant amount of scale and, and investment in technology and, and people to really manage this uh, today. This is um, not something that can be done by a small company kind of on pen and paper anymore. Doesn't sound like it. For 100,000 storefronts, there's no way you could have that on an Excel spreadsheet or something. <laughs> no, so, it, it was it was it was interesting because the the fo the founder of the 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 origins of the company I work for, they really go back to um, the late 1800s in Chicago, and I don't know if it's if if it's true or not, but the the story goes it was called Chaz Levy Circulating Company, and the story goes that the founder Charles Levy, when he was 15, won a horse and a wagon in a raffle and used the horse in the wagon as a 15 year old to begin distributing newspapers in Chicago. Hmm. And from that, from that has grown um, one of the largest distribution, periodical distribution companies and, and now the largest book distributors in the, in the country. Whether that's true or not, I love the story. <laughs> it's a great story. It's I think it actually, I, I think it actually probably is true. I mean, you think, you think about, you think about it. And of course, you know, there's no such thing as news, newsboys anymore. Those, they've all gone away as afternoon papers have gone away. And, um, you know, newspapers are distributed by, by companies and professionals that, that have to get up very early in the morning to distribute our newspapers. But um, a lot of interesting businesses have come out from that, that, that ecosystem, that industry. Yeah. Including book, including book distribution. It's amazing. Well, it, and our, the globalization of the, you know, marketplace is just, you know, someone who had a horse and buggy could never have imagined the way that we could do business <laughs> today. <laughs> that, it would have seemed, you know, or to have a, a cell phone in your hand, you know, is unbelievable. So, so when you're looking at titles and you're looking at markets, um, 
you know, I'm thinking of, for example, um, you know, when we've traveled, let's say to more rural areas and people are into, let's say hunting or gaming and all of that kind of stuff. And those books are such a, um, of high interest to those marketplaces versus other, like say an urban storefront, for example, would probably not have very many eyes for those kind of books. You know, are you getting down to that sort of a granular level of figuring out which stores would do best with which subject matters of books? Absolutely. And, that, and that's how retailers look at their stores. I mean, they, they, they view their stores in segments and um, classifications and categories. And so we map to that. And then, you know, we're looking at historical data of what books have sold in those stores and done well. And so every time we would launch a new title, the first thing we kind of ask ourselves is what, what, what book is, what historical books is this book most similar to? Mm -hmm. um, and we don't even just say what, you know, a, a book, we don't try to map it to a single book. We maybe try to map it to 10 books um, that have similar traits. Um, and, and we usually, we actually look at dozens of traits. Um, and then based on that, and then that store and where that, that store is located, what kind of shoppers they have, what kind of space they have, um, how well they've sold similar books in the past, that's what informs our decision as to whether or not we think a book can do well in that store. And if so, how many um, units we, we distribute to that store. So it is at that, it is at that level and that level is really important. Um, and the other thing that's really important is we want to, we want as broad of offering as possible. So, you know, um, five to seven years ago when eBooks first emerged in a big way, retailers reduced space. Um, they thought that the paper book was going to decline in the face of the electronic books growth. And, and so, you know, we lost space. We had to condense, um, the number of books we were able to distribute and, sell and and now um, um you know for us anyway great news that trend is reversing has has reversed um ebooks are shrinking paper books are growing and retail has responded by adding space so we're actually able to offer a significant um bigger offering so the consumer has more choice which is always wonderful um, and I think that there's also a, another driver as we, and I used to supply magazines to borders. I loved um, the border shopping experience. I miss borders so, actually. I, I you know, if, um, the old, the old buyer at borders just reached out to me last night. And the first thing I said to her was I miss borders. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it was a great place to discover new authors, mm -hmm. which is one of the more challenging things the industry has to, is facing today is how to break new authors. But, but so um, as, as Barnes and Noble shrunk, as borders closed, as if you remember Walden and B Dalton, mm -hmm. as they, as they have closed as retail grocery, especially shrunk space, um, you know, book, books became harder to buy, harder to find in retail in America. Most categories in America are over retailed, meaning just too much of it. As Amazon has grown, we need less physical storefronts. We need fewer um, stores and less, less things on shelves. But books is actually one of the, one of the few categories that I can think of, maybe, maybe only a couple that you can think of where there's actually not enough bookstores. Mm. Um, in America for the number of books being sold and the number of people that read books. And so um, we need more places selling books and um, retail um, retailers are smart. They, they see that they get that. Um, and just like when the toys or us close, you know, the, the some of the big retailers expanded their toy selections. Um, you know, retailers are trying to take advantage of, of that trend. And we also, you know, generally speaking, we sit in, you know, what we'll call the entertainment category of a retail um, trade. So they look at us and combine, you know, connection with how magazines are doing, how CDs are doing, how DVDs are doing, how video games are doing. And with books doing well and some of those other categories struggling, they're also, that also causes them to want to allocate more space to books. So as store as stores are remodeling, as new stores are being built, um, we're seeing larger departments, better space, 
um, which is great for, um, you know, our industry. Um, and the larger space is also great for those, you know, kind of up and coming new authors, smaller publishers, because there just is more space on the shelves to sell and present more books. I mean, we, we rarely, you know, want to present, um, you know, 10 facings of the same book. We'd like to, you know, there's some books that warrant a, a display and a lot of exposure, you know, these big authors, big titles. Um, but, you know, the, the, if you want to know the main line in most, most retail communities, there, you know, there's a book would have one or two facings at most. And then, you know, so we're looking for other great books to, to present and um, it gives us an opportunity to see, you know, see if something will do well. And if it starts doing well, then we can expand it and accelerate it. And we, we've seen a couple of those in the last 12 months. And that's really exciting. That is exciting. It makes my heart happy to hear that book sales are going well and that books are being well received and, and departments are being expanded because I do know that, you know, when the ebook came out and everyone, you know, when Kindle was fresh and everyone was getting their Kindles for Christmas and kind of like it was a, a little bit of a scary time for a book lover like me because I'm like, oh, but I really love actual books, you know, the actual smell of books and the feel of books. And it's good to know, you know, most people I, that I talk to anyways, and I'm sure that you do as well, would prefer a book in hand than a book on a device. By the end of the day, I don't want to look at my device anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there definitely is a, a core ebook reader um, that loves the, the kind of that, that you know, technology. Um, but, you know, really the phone has become the killer kind of device and reading a book on a phone. Every time I see somebody reading a book on a phone or in an airplane reading a book on a phone, I, I just want to want to ask them what's wrong with them. I'm like, what are you <laughs> trying to do there? What's going on? And so, and, um, and you know, similarly when I, you know, I read, obviously, um, love to read. So um, I, I guess not obviously, but I do love to read. And so, you know, every time I'm reading a book on an airplane or something, I, you, you know, usually see somebody next to me reading a book and, you know, probably more times than not, they say, oh, you know, I love to read, I love paper books. And I, you know, it's, so people like comment on the fact that I have a paper book on an airplane, but um, <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think um, people who, who love books um, do have a tendency to love the paper and the feel of the book. It's a pretty, sure. you know, you talked about technology advances. A book is pretty good technology. Um, you know, I have a couple books that are slowly falling apart from being read too many times, but, um, for the most part, they're, you know, pretty efficient at, at, uh, maintaining their, their value and they're easy to share and not always easy to get back sometimes for people you share with, but yeah. easy to share and, um, easy to, to stack on a shelf or, um, store. So, um, yeah, I have, bo I have, bo I have boxes of books, um, kind of around never for some reason um, book lovers never want to throw away a book oh my god no way I know it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> no no that's a sin and, and, <laughs> and, and now and now and now in you know in COVID-19 um, stay in place or stay at home and shelter in place uh, you know hey every, everybody has time to go back to their bookshelves and and find a find a book that they remember reading 10, 15 years ago and read it, read it again. That's true. So in, you know, in back to the the different marketplaces and the different books that will sell well in those, are there certain types of books or genres that you find are able to cross, you know, a number of different markets more easily than more niche specific books? Um, you know, every every you know, we segment books, you know, we start with nonfiction and fiction, children's and adult, um, uh, you know, young adult, uh, we, we go into uh, segments. I mean, there's definitely books like the Bible that will sell everywhere yeah. um, and, and have been selling everywhere for a long, long time. Um, and then, you know, there's trends, right? And then, and, and trends emerge and, um, you know, book publishers are data focused as well. They follow trends. Retailers understand retail trends. And so I think we, you know, we see um, trends come and we go. 
and they go, um, things get hot and then they, they cool off. Um, and, you know, then you have your, your, your kind of core list and, you know, um, it's a somewhat of a modern invention, but, you know, Tom Clancy's still publishing every year, multiple books, even though, you know, he hasn't been alive in a long time. Um, and his fans love it. Um, they've accepted the, these kind of, uh, um, you know, these, these authors, characters continue to live um, past, past when they are alive. And so, um, and then there's the, you know, the John Grishams of the world that publish once a year and, you know, the, his fans just can't wait to see that book in the fall. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of those examples out there that still are big, big sellers and huge fan bases and people just can't wait. Um, and then there's kind of that, you know, those cultural moments like, you know, you know, George Martin, who was big in the book world and, a lot of people love that fantasy book. Um, I don't know, maybe they started reading fantasy books as a kid, Lord of the Rings, or, or, or you know, kind of started in the Harry Potter land. Um, and then, obviously, you know, George Martin became this massive kind of cultural moment with HBO. And who could have predicted that? And so I think everybody, you know, kind of is sitting around, can't wait for his next book to come out. Um, and, you know, we're... We're, you know, our business is, is, is to, to a large extent, you know, can be hit driven. We're a little bit like the movies, right. With the big blockbuster movies. Um, and so the industry um, needs those big books. And typically when those big books uh, come out, they help book sales across the board, meaning, you know, people tend to go back to the book department, buy a book that they're desperately wanting to read. Right. And while they're there, they pick up two or three other books. Yeah. So and retailers, <laughs> right. And, you know, the other thing I think re retailers understand, interestingly enough, is book buyers, book readers are usually their, you know, some of their best customers. So when a, when a, when a customer buys a book, um, you know, those are usually bigger purchases, bigger baskets is the way retailers think about it. And so, um, you know, the, the biggest, the best customers of retailers really value the book offering. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a lot, a lot of positives books, um, bring to the retail community. It's good. Cause we're smart. We're smart consumers. So, you know, <laughs> I, I... <laughs> yes, I'm sure your audience is mostly book readers. So I think we can all agree that we're smart. We're smart. Yes, people. I, I would say so. <laughs> Why not? If we all, so, if we all say so ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. There's an argument here. So. I would, I'm curious, you know, in the, in the day and age, of course, where you're, you know, you've got your John Gershams and Tom Clancy's and Stephen King's and the, those really solid, well-established authors that can put out anything and not to say that they're not obviously marketing their books and utilizing, you know, public relations and whatnot, but how does an author um, get to that point where they can break, break through on a book? What, what have you seen in your world? Well, you know, because of the number of books that we do distribute, we, we you know, we, we often see that happen and it almost is inevitable, right? Because if you distribute thousands and tens of thousands of books, um, you're going to be part of, a, you know, one of them breaking out. Um, I, I think, um, you know, social media probably is, is really important, you know, um, Somewhere, somehow, a person reads a book and really loves it, and she tells eight of her friends, and those eight friends tell eight of her friends, and so you just get this kind of um, interesting kind of groundswell of, of support. Um, you know, people like uh, Oprah have done an amazing job highlighting books that, you know, and people really trust her view and, and her insights, and so when she recommends a book, people, you know, I'll run to get that book Lammer and say, Hey, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, there's, it's kind of fun, right? When everybody's reading the same book and then you have something to talk about with, with your friends. And so, um, but you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily think there's a, like a recipe, right. It's, it just, I think it needs to happen organically. Um, and kind of, that's usually how it happens. You know, once again, unless you're, somehow able to get your book in front of Oprah and she loves it. <laughs> if you could do that every time. Every author a, hopes for that. <laughs> if you can do that every time, that would be a great strategy. Um, yeah. But you know, there, there's, there's a lot of, um, 
um, personality driven books. Um, you know, uh, someone like a Reese Witherspoon, for example, putting out a book, um, you're seeing more and more of that. Um, and so, you know, what they're really leveraging is their fan base from another medium, um, and their social media audience, um, to really drive, um, you know, book sales. Um, Speaking so of that, I just saw this morning on uh, Facebook, an author who's local here in Naples, Glennon Doyle, who you know, Glennon Doyle Melton, her book Untamed, which is new, just got endorsed by Reese Witherspoon. There you go. So that was that's, really that's, exciting. That's, yeah, that's going to be, I mean, not that she doesn't already have, you know, pretty huge following herself, but, you know, cross-pollination like that of two pretty strong personalities is like a great recipe for success. Yeah, I mean, you know, the best the best kind of uh, recommendation is one that you've earned, right? And if it's from a social media influencer with millions of followers, that can that creates demand. You know, I I still love old fashioned book signings. You know, get out and meet your fans. Mm -hmm. um, we talked of, we talked about borders. I know that's becoming harder and harder to do today, um, but you know, we encourage it. Um, that we do we do signings. Um, all, all year, all the time. Um, you know, I have uh, some some people I know in the you know ex-military, retired military, um, and that have written books. And you know, the military exchanges are a great place to go and you know sign books and 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 meet meet a great customer base that would support you. And you know, once again, if you you touch twenty or thirty people or fifty people in one of those signings. I mean, you know, with social media, that could be amplified into thousands very quickly. You know, hey, you wouldn't believe who I met today. And I got a, my picture. Here's my picture with this author and they signed my book. And, you know, you know, you know, he was a Navy SEAL kind of a thing. And, and that can be like, oh, my God, I got to go check out that book. So those are the kind of things, you know, takes effort, work. Um, you know, not everybody can call up their PR uh, person and get on Fox and Friends in the morning or, you know, on a, on a, on a morning show with, uh, or late night show and, and be interviewed by a, and seen by millions of people. So sometimes you just have to do a little bit of ground game. For sure. For sure. So, um, I guess I'd like to kind of close bringing it a little bit down to the, the area that I work in as an independent publisher, because there's a lot of independent publishers who follow this podcast and a lot of independent authors. So how does an independent author um, or publisher, if possible, work with any sort of distribution, or is it best for them to focus on, as you said, you know, kind of going around doing your own marketing, doing your own book signing, sort of building up that um, traction through word of mouth, um, and then for reader link, as they, as you mentioned earlier, that um, you know, not only do you work with the five big publishers, but you work with a lot of publishers. How do those relationships work at you know the smaller level for people that aren't um, you know, working at with, you know, millions of dollars and hundreds of employees. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we, we have a, we have a group of people who are book buyers that had, you know, been buying books and in some cases for not, not to give away their ages, but for many, many years, they love <laughs> books. They're always looking for books. People are always presenting books to them. Um, they're, you know, they are really out there in, in search of and trying to find great books um, that we can get behind. And so, um, you know, we're, we're always on the, on the, on the prowl for the, for something great that we can help support. Um, but you're, you're right. It, it isn't the easiest thing to do to break into kind of big box retail as a small independent publisher. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to figure out a way to, um, you know, find your niche, find the place where you can um, do, do, you know, do well and, and then try to grow it from, from there. Um, you know, especially if you're, you're, you know, an author who wants to have a career in writing and you're not just trying to, you know, write a single book. If you're trying to write a series or a group of books, or you want to put out a book a year or a book every other year, you know, st you know, start building your fan base. Um and, and once you get, you know, people, if they're great, if it's a great book and people become aware, um, 
then the demand will exist and you'll find your way into our world and our ecosystem and, and your sales will grow. Um, but, you know, you have to, it, it's very rare that somebody says, Hey, you know, I'm an independent author and I'm or a small independent publisher and I want to present my book to the buyer at uh, one of the largest retailers in the world. And they're going to say, you know, this is, this is great. Let's, you know, I'll buy a hundred thousand of them. Um, I mean, that, that stuff just doesn't happen. And truthfully, the independent publisher doesn't want to take that level of risk either printing those copies and in, in the hopes that the, that they'll, they'll find a buyer um, because, you know, the, the publishers end up taking the risk on the print runs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, which is you know, important I, to note what, for those who are out there thinking about distribution, not to reiterate what you're saying, but it was something that, you know, when John and I had, um, our first conversation probably last month, and I was asking him all of these questions and getting all of this insight into his world. And I would, that's what brought this podcast to being today, because I was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of stuff I personally didn't know because like the mystery of like, what's behind the curtain of the wizard of Oz. And really that as an independent author or someone working with an independent publisher like O'Leary Publishing, you know, the risk is on the author and the publisher to, to invest in the print copies. If you can get a book buyer to say, like you said, oh, we'd like a hundred thousand copies. Well, now you're responsible to print a hundred thousand copies and hand them over. And then, as you said, they may or may not sell. I mean, you hope that you've got the right strategies and they're in the right markets and whatever, but if they don't, you may end up with a large quantity of returns, which would be um, you know, devastating for some who would be taking a lot of financial risk. So it makes sense now to me why there is a process in place to sort of grow your following, grow your organic audience, You know, take one step at a time. You don't go to college before you graduate kindergarten. You know. Not that I'm suggesting yeah, I, we're in kindergarten, but I'm saying, you know, there's a process and there's a season. And, and as you grow and like you said, as the demand grows, you'll find your way. Yeah. And, and, Is that fair? And Is that a fair statement? For, for, for sure. And I think the, I think the, I mean, look at it, look at an, an author like George Martin that's achieved this level of success through, you know, you know, he, he was probably was tolling, you know, in the in obscurity for 20 plus years before he burst on the scene right so you know every one of these authors is an example of someone starting small that wasn't published by anybody large that that eventually built an, an amazing fan base and um you know library of of books that people love and so um it, it not only can it happen it happens every day right? If it didn't happen, we wouldn't have all these um, great authors that everybody loves. They all came from the same place, right? But nobody knew who they were and nobody read their books. Um, <laughs> and, and so then now they're where they are. So, you know, it's, it's not only, um, not only can it happen, it is happening. It does happen, but yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, we, we take the financial um, risk of distributing and then if it doesn't sell, we have to you know, bring it back and all that extra handling. And we don't get paid by the retailer for a book that doesn't sell either. So um, we're all highly incentivized to make sure that when we do distribute a book, um, it sells. Um, but at the same time, we understand that the returns are going to be part of the inefficient, some level of inefficiency is part of the ecosystem we live in because we're also trying to maximize sales, right? So when you, as an independent publisher, you, you kind of learn, that the, you know, to print a thousand books costs you one, you know, one thing, but if you print 10,000, it becomes cheaper per book. So, you know, people are trying to find what is that right sweet spot for each book? You know, what is the, you know, where do we, where we maximize sales, but also, you know, kind of minimize financial risk. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, for those big, for those big publisher houses, publishing houses, um, you know, they can, you know, they, they're able to, they have the financial strength to invest millions and millions of dollars um, in, in, in trying to, just, you know, publish a book that they are pretty sure is going to do well, but it might not. Um, and so they, you know, they have that ability. And if it's, and if they're wrong, they're not going to go out of business, right? They'll, they'll go on right. to the next book. And that happens all the time. Um, you know, we see books, um, who do much better than we thought, we thought like, uh, Michelle Obama's, 
um, book um, um, a, a little over a year ago. And I mean, it did incredibly well. Nobody was expecting the demand it did. Now, once again, Oprah was involved. She did this say, unbelievable Oprah. tour. Yeah, she did this unbelievable tour. And, you know, people were super interested in her, but didn't know a lot about her. So she was kind of somewhat of a mystery, right? So, um, you know, people people were interested and wanted to know. And and so it created this this moment. Um, and we didn't have enough books. And we were we were chasing it, chasing it, chasing it, chasing it. And I'm sure the publisher was scrambling for printer capacity around the country, trying to find ways to print more of these books. And, you know, our retail partners were saying, you know, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. Um, and so those things can happen and, 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 and do happen. But, you know, obviously um, when you're the first lady, you have a built-in advantage from a PR perspective, <laughs> former first lady. Yeah. So, and yeah. we're still all waiting for the president of uh, Obama's book. And then it'll be an interesting, I wonder if him, I wonder if uh, he will have a wager with his wife who will, who will end up at the end of the day selling more books. Mm. Um, I actually will say I I got hers on Audible and I've been listening to it and it's very well written and she's very endearing. She reads her audio book. So I do. By the way, if you can't, if you can, that's the only way to do it. I mean, an author really should read their own audio book. Yeah. Yeah. I I enjoy listening to it back and forth to the office and whatnot, but I, I, you know, it's nice to get a peek inside of someone's personal life when you only see sort of the front facing you know, first lady persona, but there was one scene she talked about after the whole thing was over and they're out of the White House and she was at home by herself and she made herself a piece of cheesy bread by herself. And that was like such a revolution. Like I sat on my own couch eating my own piece of cheesy bread and you're like, wow, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, but it, 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 even somewhat of a, a more obscure celebrity like Jessica Simpson, you know, not for my generation, she's not obscure, but, you know, she hasn't <laughs> been necessarily in the in the mainstream um, pop culture for a while. You know, she wrote a book that was, you know, extremely open and honest about who she was, where she came from and her challenges. And people loved it. The book sold unbelievably well. Um, you know, people really respond to that level of um, authenticity because I think it, you know, to in a lot of celebrity culture, right, the authenticity is absent by I mean, almost by definition, right? These people are playing characters, right. so we have a chance to to really, um, you know, in country music stars, Garth Garth did a great book with a with a music companion, um, and we see more of that, right? Is is people who have these um, are fans and from movies or TV or our music, um, they often do really great books because, you know, we're fans and we know them from, you know, what they do, but we don't really know who they are. So, you know, the book gets a, a, little, a little bit of insight. I love those books. I love seeing behind the curtain, like who that person is and saying, wow, they, you know, are a normal person. You know, I think that's, what's interesting right now, aside from, you know, the books and what we're talking about, but, speak of musicians now that everyone's sort of at this stay at home order kind of thing. And a lot of musicians are just playing from their living room, you know, and the kids are screaming in the background and whatever. And you're like, it makes you like them more. Cause you see yeah, they're, they're just, you they're know, real. They're real people. They're real people. <laughs> <laughs> they're real people. Yeah. It's crazy how that works, but Anyhow, so, so to wrap it up, you know, I know we had talked about some of the highlight um, events for authors and publishers and just touch on those if you would, um, things that you would recommend for people who are growing, you know, their knowledge of the industry and wanting to network and all that. What are some of the places that you think are important for people to show up at? Well, you know, um, the, the, the place that everybody still shows up at in, in, in a real way and, and has both a private kind of industry side and then a public side there after, right after is Book Expo, which, you know, now is in New York City. It used to travel a lot more, uh, but now it's mostly in New York City. Um, so if you're in the industry, I would strongly encourage you to come to book book expo everybody a lot of people have scheduled meetings and not you know not everybody is available to just anybody but all the major publishing a lot of the independent publishers there's a whole section for them a whole area for them um you know that they have displays and they're usually the publisher is there meeting people willing to talk and 
Um, it's amazing how generous this generous this industry is to to people, um, other people in this industry. And so, you know, there's that's a great that's a great event um, for for people to really kind of see what's going on in the industry and you know what's coming next. There's an author signing area where literally hundreds of of authors are signing books from their upcoming releases, and so you can see really so kind of cool. what the next six to 12 months of publishing looks like. And um, it's a lot of fun. And like I said, people, um, people are there and amazingly available and um, very generous with their, with their time. And so if you're, if you love the business or new to the industry or just want to see how kind of the whole thing works, that's a great place to start. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, John. You've been amazing. You've provided so much insight and a lot of fun. And I know for those who are listening here who are, of course, book lovers, interested in reading, writing, publishing, um, this was a lot of valuable information and I know your time is valuable. So thank you again for being a part of I'm Booked. And I hope our paths cross soon in person. That would be awesome. And I do plan to attend Book Expo. So I know that's been rescheduled due to all of the... Um, crazy pandemic going on right now, which hopefully, you know, God willing, will subside fairly quickly. But anyone's to say. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Look forward to meeting you in person and, and be safe. Thanks. Take care. So this has been another episode of the I'm Book Podcast. I'm April O'Leary signing off. Be sure to hop on over to O'LearyPublishing.com to start your author adventure and see what writing a book could do for you in your profession, in your career, and what doors it might open. We thank our guests for being a part of the show today and be sure to subscribe to podcasts here on YouTube. We look forward to serving you and helping you get your book out into the world.